everyone. Hi. Uh, this is uh, Ray and Malcolm. And uh, Malcolm's actually going to run the, the slideshow, so, but I'll talk for this part. Um, I'm the director of F5 Labs, and Malcolm is a researcher with F5 Labs. We've both been with F5 for a long time. Malcolm, many, many, many years, as you've heard. Um, F5 Labs is actually the threat research wing of F5. So we uh, got a bunch of cool data to share with you today. So let's just get on with it. Should go to the next slide, please. So we have a partnership with Effluxio, who's run by many different names, Lorica, Baffin Bay, now they're called Effluxio, but it's essentially the, the same folks that we've been working with since 2017. And they have a, a global honeypot network. And um, <clears throat> we collect a lot of data from them and various things. And one of the things that we really single our attention on is their web sensors or web attacks. So we actually have um, it says variable number of sensors is easily to say in the hundreds uh, all over the world. And we see, as you see, 11,000 events per day on average. And that's just the web attacks. And we actually are able to capture a bunch of data. Uh, what, what these honeypots do is they actually simulate a, a web server in the most basic sense. They see an incoming connection and they kind of answer like, yeah, yeah, I speak port 80. Here's, here's you know, my HTTP. And then we grab that session and then they shovel all that data to us. And so we've been doing various stories and analysis on upcoming attack trends and things like that and, and kind of interesting events. And we'll get into that as we go along. But we also decided we were, you know, for the special 20th anniversary, we wanted to do like a big picture. So let's look at all the data we had. So we have 8.5 million events and, and Malcolm crunched through it and found some really interesting things. Uh, and we're also gonna talk a little bit about the process that we did, because I think that's also interesting and useful to you especially if you want to be doing some of this stuff on your own as well. Uh, go ahead to the next one, which I think. Uh, I think yeah, that's you where take I over. take over. Yeah. yeah. So I, I can talk a little bit about some of the tooling that was used for the analysis. Um, we use a pretty standard set of data analysis tools, uh, Python, uh, including libraries like Pandas and NumPy, Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, some are. Uh, and most recently, Elasticsearch. And uh, Elasticsearch has been really extremely helpful when, uh, when I approach this project to not just do an analysis of a relatively limited time period, like say a month or, or a quarter, but instead tried to look at this entire data set that covered years. Uh, that gave us the scaling that we needed. Um, originally, the data was in uh, comma-separated values, and now it's in JSON. Um, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, some tools work better with some and others with others. It's been relatively easy to, to transform the data between the two as we needed to. Uh, but if you were designing a system like this yourself, I would probably recommend that you consider JSON uh, as being the more flexible uh, format for it. We've uh, managed to come up with automated ingestion. Uh, it's approaching real time. We, we're at about a day now, um, about a day lag. Uh, we're hoping to be able to get it down to hourly or even just direct pipelining into our analysis uh, infrastructure um, so that we can start doing some really good automated analysis on it. Um, we've, we've obviously done a fair amount of trends over time looking at different attack patterns, but what we would like to do is to use this as a source to be able to profile the attack patterns, for example, URLs that we're seeing, um, you know, get request URLs uh, that we're seeing and start to, uh, in a probably using some sort of machine learning, you know, classify them automatically and detect anomalies as we go forward so that we can see new attack patterns coming forth. That will also, uh, using some of the other fields that we have, allow us to do some attacker profiling. Where are they coming from? What time are they coming in from? What ASN are they coming in from? That sort of thing. Um, and we also have geolocation data, which would allow us to do uh, more regional reports, both on where scans are coming from and where they're heading to. Some of the challenges that we faced uh, is essentially that uh, over time, when you're looking at a data set this large, um, we were looking uh, at different pieces of data earlier than we are later. Uh, we've added the things that we are uh, capturing. We've uh, changed around some of the ways that we capture that data. So there was a fair amount of uh, data cleaning and, and uh, coalescing that needed to be done. 
Um, obviously also, uh, as Ray mentioned, we have a couple of hundred sensors minimum, but that number has actually gone up significantly. And the more sensors we have, uh, the harder it is to ingest the data that we're getting. Um, the web data set is, uh, as these things go, relatively small, but we also have some other data sets that are probably in order of magnitude um, or two larger. Um, and that starts getting a little bit difficult to do without some pretty serious infrastructure behind it. Uh, it's just quite a lot of data. Uh, right now, the classification of the web attacks that we're seeing uh, in terms of like, what does this request represent in terms of an attack is a mainly manual process. Uh, and we're hoping, as I said, to automate that, but that was a bit of uh, a chore to go through even the relatively limited set that we have here uh, and come up with some sort of reasonable classification scheme. And there are, of course, costs associated with maintaining the sensors, storing all the data in a way that you can get to it easily and do your analysis, uh, and also just preserving it over the long term. I, I think an awful lot of companies have much of the same sort of data uh, from, say, their web application firewall or their logs even, but they don't necessarily keep five, 10 years worth of it to be able to do this sort of trending that we're gonna do. So we started off by classifying the attacks. And in order to be able to talk about this, I think I need to define a little bit more about what the sensors can do and what they also, what they don't do. None of these sensors have DNS host names. They're not pretending to be a specific company or a specific vertical or, you know, um, Bob's uh, happy fun web, site or whatever it happens to be. There's there's no particular thing. They're really just an IP address hanging out on the internet, waiting for traffic to arrive to them. They additionally don't pretend to be a specific platform. They're not pretending to be an Apache with PHP or an Nginx uh, or something that has you know JavaScript on it or anything else like that. They're really just a listener listening on port 80 and port 443 able to receive an HTTP or a TLS connection, negotiate it properly and record the request that comes in. That's literally it. Um, so what does this give us in terms of the visibility into what's happening on the internet and the web? It gives us the ability to see scans that are widely and non-specifically targeted. Um, these are scans that are probably going and traversing a large section of the IP space. Uh, they are not targeted to specific companies. They're not targeted to specific domains. They are really just going and perhaps scanning, you know, a, a class A at a time or something like that. That probably dates me a little bit, but <laughs> a large number of IP addresses at a time. And so it's reasonable to conclude that the attacks are automated and are done at scale and are probably done, therefore, uh, by attackers who are looking for easy wins. They're, they're not necessarily targeting a specific industry or site. They are just trying to find things that they can break into or uh, install software on, which we'll get to in a little bit, or um, uh, retrieve information from. Attack classification is... Uh, the next thing really that we looked at. Um, and as I said, um, what we've generally seen, and, and I think this is actually probably true uh, for a, a large amount of attacks on the internet, is that attackers are, are going to target technologies and not necessarily industries. Um, they are uh, picking up public vulnerabilities quickly. Um, those get weaponized, automated, and start being used. And they continue being used for a very long time, as we'll see. Um, the most apparent goals that we've been able to determine from what we've seen, and this is mainly from um, command injection payloads, is they are interested in uh, installing crypto miners uh, or building botnets. Uh, and probably the most common botnet that we've seen, uh, general classification of botnet, I should say, is for doing denial of service attacks, uh, such as the XRD DOS. Um, many of these attacks can be automated completely. You see, that, you see a get request comes in that, that uses a command injection, that issues a curl command, that downloads something from some server somewhere, untars it somewhere and starts running it. And, and you can do that all on one get request. 
Secondarily, we see a lot of attempts at uh, going and looking for files that would reveal credentials. Uh, .env, for example, where um, unfortunately you find a lot of database credentials uh, or general configuration files that may, may include passwords or key data. And so from this, we conclude that um, at least this particular subset of attackers are going to be using the shortest path to their goal. And their goal is widespread compromise uh, and information theft. So they're not going to be particularly picky about what tools or technologies they use. So now we can talk a little bit about what sort of attacks you might be expecting. And we can say generally that any HTTP or TLS endpoint will be scanned probably within less than one hour of it being visible. Um, and your authentication endpoints will be cred stuffed and brute forced. Uh, if it's got a login box on it uh, that can be exercised by a remote attacker, uh, it's going to be exercised by a remote attacker. Any data that's in the open is going to be found and taken. Um, specifically, PHP will be enumerated for command injection vulnerabilities. Uh, we see a ton of requests for common test script names, you know, for example, test.php or shell.php or aaa.php or temp.php, any of these sorts of things, which I assume is uh, attackers looking for people coming up with a quick little test script, leaving it out in the open, and perhaps being able to find something that they can exercise to, to do a command injection, most likely. Interestingly, APIs, specific API URLs, in other words, ones that comply to a format that, that indicates an API endpoint, uh, slash API would be the most common one, obviously, but there's many other patterns that we see uh, are being actively scanned for. They are going to be found and they are going to get poked at quite uh, sufficiently. And finally, uh, any public web vulnerability, any CVE that comes out that um, anybody has any idea about how to actually use are going to be picked up quickly, turned uh, into an automated uh, tool, and you're going to see those all the time. Uh, I'm just going to pause briefly. OK, uh, thank you for the time warning. So um, in order to take a look at this data over this large chunk of time, we use the following approach. We looked for the top 50 requested URIs per month, uh, 2017 to 21 inclusive, uh, until just a little while ago in mid-August. Actually, um, yeah, a little while ago in mid-August. We normalized it for the number of sensors so that we had uh, comparable data sets uh, and we did some manual classification. Um, we broke it out this way. We came up with APIs, uh, specifically the enumeration and attempted execution of APIs, authentication, um, which is request for login pages or specific login attempts, post requests with credential data in them. Uh, we looked for code and content inclusion which I'm defining here as cross-site scripting, local file inclusion, remote file inclusion, and several other techniques. Information theft and recon, which is, as I mentioned, looking for, for example, .env files or uh, .password files or .hd access files, those sorts of things. Injection and remote command execution, uh, specifically command injection most often, but also specific remote code execution vulnerabilities. And then finally, uh, SQL injection, which we separated out from injection more generally uh, because we saw in the data uh, a really interesting pattern emerge. So here's what we saw. Um, over, obviously, on the left, we have 2017 all the way to the right, 2021. The green color on your screen is what we observed for SQL injection attacks. And as you can see, they were by far the majority of the attacks that we saw from when our data set started in 2017 until about July of 2018. And they were ubiquitous. There was just so many of them. Um, code and content inclusion did have a representation in there as well as authentication, some of the other categories here. Then we saw a really big shift there was a sudden spike in injection RCE classified attacks. And 
Uh, I think we're going to figure out exactly what those were here in a couple of slides. But after that point, you'll notice over on the right side of the graph, especially with the orange, which is off, and the blue, which is API, a significant and ever-increasing trend for scans that were targeting those two classifications. I think this is really, really interesting. Um, what we may be seeing here, and this is speculation, but what we may be seeing here is a shift from using traditional SQL-backed web architectures to perhaps ones using no SQL, uh, or perhaps just people fixing SQL vulnerabilities, um, which made those attacks less likely to succeed. And at the same time, we see an increasing amount of API usage uh, and also attackers just pivoting to what they can reasonably conclude that they can get in with. Uh, in other words, API, cred stuffing, password spraying, all those sorts of techniques. Um, the, info, uh, the info theft and recon category has been growing as well. Um, and the injection RCE has uh, continued to be something that we've seen a lot of. But I really want to call out that specific trend of increases in auth and API traffic because I really think that that's actually where, that's a major shift that we're seeing. Um, it may be that uh, some older techniques that attackers were using are less effective, um, but they are definitely keeping up with the shifts in web architecture that we're seeing where APIs and microservices and that sort of thing are becoming more common and they are definitely arising into the, uh, the targeting that attackers are doing here. So we found a couple of, just to call out a couple of different things that we found that were kind of interesting. Um, CVE 2017 80, 9841, my apologies, was actually found in 2017. It emerged strongly in 2019. Um, we caught it uh, about halfway through September in 2019. Um, it's been continuous in our data set since October 2020. Now, um, it peaked somewhere in there, uh, but it still continues to this day. And uh, it's still quite significant, which I think is interesting because one would assume that uh, such an old CVE would perhaps fall out of the data set that attackers are using, but it's not happening. Uh, they continue to use it. Now, whether this is because it's easier just to leave it in or whether it's actually still being effective, I don't actually know. Um, my suspicion is probably more the latter. Um, generally speaking, attackers are pretty good about optimizing uh, what they're doing for efficiency. Um, and when you're scanning large chunks of the internet, that becomes an important thing. So um, I'm expecting that this particular CVE is probably something that they're still finding some um, instances of. CVE 2019, uh, 11510 does actually tell a slightly different story, which is this was a, a, a vulnerability in the um, Pulse Secure SSL VPN. It was a critical, uh, the CVSS score of 10. Um, we saw it first uh, at the very beginning of August. Uh, it had a huge spike right after that in mid-August. Um, scans continue to this day, but at a much lower level. And uh, just to correlate that a tiny bit, uh, that might actually be corresponding to that August, um, some of these actually. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm getting this a little bit confused. Some of this definitely accounts for um, the spikes that you see, actually that first blue spike there, um, especially the 2019 11510 was definitely present within that two month span where you see the first big light blue spike. Now with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ray to talk about a few other interesting things that we've found. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through these a little quicker because we're kind of running out of time here. But uh, you know, also can see the links in the bottom of the, of the site here, so, or the video, so you can actually go to the site and see the, the longer versions of these little stories. Um, one of the things we did when we first started analyzing this data is we saw this huge spike of PHP attacks. Now we see a lot of PHP, um, but actually starting to uh, one of our other researchers, uh, Sander Vindberg, who works on the uh, App Protect report found was these were actually coming just from two servers, uh, two particular servers at a North American university and just targeting a couple of CVEs. But these things were 
pretty much swamping our data to the point where we actually had to take them out of our data set and separate them just so that we could see everything else because they were pushing everything back down. But it kind of goes to show that like, you know, there are boxes out there that just go crazy and they just run crazy for months. We did try to contact the owners. Um, that can just, you know, spray across the internet constantly as a, as a loud horn. Uh, go on to the next slide, please. I was going to say these are some, yeah. So another thing that we saw, another big spike in scanning. And um, we also look at the, these things globally. And this is combined both web traffic and some non-web traffic. So we, it was kind of funny. The analyst came to us and said, hey, there's this huge spike of scans against Singapore coming from Russia in this week. What's going, you know, what's going on? I said, President Trump is in Russia right now meeting with, with the president of North Korea. And I was like, oh, oh, wow. Well, these are all SIP scans and IoT scans. So, you know, are we looking at some sort of interesting uh, espionage action? It's like, who knows? And who knows if it's actually Russia? I mean, you, know, you never know when you're looking at an IP address. Uh, go on to the, to the next slide. I was going to say, we started following this data. And next thing we know, we saw the same thing in Finland, except for now the scans were coming from China. And he was meeting with Vladimir Putin. Um, so, it, you know, you just see some kind of interesting, weird stuff in the data. Uh, go on to the, the next one, please. And lastly, we, we were looking through the data and just uh, noticed there was a coffee pot. A coffee pot was hitting our, our network, just scanning away. And, and, and you know, some of the, the people kind of went, oh, my God, it's a coffee pot bot. You know, it's, it's the end of the world. I was like, oh, maybe somebody just misconfigured something or I don't know. It was beaconing, but it was. Uh, if anybody's got any theories as to what this was about, I'd love to hear it because it was it was pretty bizarre. Um, and we have not seen it since because we've definitely been looking for it. Um, go ahead to the next one, Malcolm. And take over, please. OK. So if you want to do something like you like this yourself, um, it's prob probable that you can. Um, in my experience, web logs and WAF logs can be treasure troves if especially you um, maybe do some pre-analysis and store perhaps even just some counts of what you see for the long term and then continue that over time, you're going to get some interesting trending data. You can use a similar approach with your network edge. Uh, you can sample. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily have to capture absolutely everything because I know that can be challenging, especially with uh, the sort of amount of data that we have flowing in and out of our networks. Uh, but even some random sampling can, can yield some interesting results. Uh, and it's actually really interesting to see what's hitting you, even if it's like, getting blocked, uh, or even if it you know, never reaches uh, anything in your infrastructure because it's stopped at the firewall. Um, I think that, that that actually, while you don't want to spend obviously tons of time analyzing it and tons of space storing it, uh, occasionally checking in on it or gathering some summary data is actually pretty useful to kind of figure out what sorts of things attackers are trying. And when you see a shift in their behavior, it can give you a little bit of a, a distant early warning. Like maybe you're not using APIs yet. Maybe your company is not quite there yet um, or is you know trying to figure out if that should be your strategy. Well, maybe you could make the case that you need to invest in some API security before you roll that out given the fact that you might be seeing a lot of API traffic getting something, uh, even though you don't actually have it yet. The big picture takeaways here, um, attacks against API and author rising. Those are the, the two things that I would recommend anybody really be looking at. Are, does your authentication endpoints have adequate protections in terms of protection against brute force, credential stuffing, obviously good passwords, password reuse, all of the sorts of things um that that you need to do to protect your auth infrastructure and i know for a fact that the oas website has a huge amount of data about many of these techniques so i would refer you there um, sql injection is falling off uh certainly it's still an issue if you use uh, sql um to back your apps but it does seem to be falling off but command injection remains very popular so basic app security stuff to protect yourself against command injection is absolutely there one interesting question that i had was since the OWASP top 10 combines SQL injection and command injection into one category, is the fall off in SQL injection and a steady state in command injection the reason why injection has fallen a position or two within the OWASP top 10 that was just recently released? I think it might be, but I'd be interested to hear if anybody has any data on that. Info disclosure is 
on the rise. People are looking for places where people store passwords or leave authentication keys around, whether that's .env or .git files or anything like that. So having some hygiene around how you store things is extremely important. Uh, and then public vulnerabilities, of course, you know, attackers pick these up as quickly as they can, which is often very fast within a week or two. Um, and they use them heavily for about three months. Um, and then they don't go away. They, they last for sometimes years uh, within the tool sets of the attackers. So with that, we're done. Um, thank you very much for uh, your time. And uh, if you wanna get in touch with us, um, you can hit, find us on Twitter, LinkedIn. We have a, a great email newsletter as well. Ray, do you wanna say anything else? Come to f5labs.com. There's, it's just all material. You can download it. There's no advertising or anything. It's for the security community. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks very much.